thank you so much everyone for joining us today um, as part of British Beauty Week. Um, today um this lunchtime hopefully you've uh, got a nice snack or something to eat um because we are going to be diving into the world of nail care the nail category uh in general and really looking at um how we can map out the future of the category by analyzing how nails are reflecting a change in culture in the uk today so um just to introduce who we are, we are Space Doctors. We are um, an agency that specializes in cultural and semiotic insights. So we really look at changing behavior, changing cultural meanings, um, and that helps to bring us um, through a trajectory into the future um, to see kind of what the emergent things that we can see that are coming through in the category. Um, and we use those insights to help strategize and activate for the future. So I'm Alex, I've got Steve with me here as well today. Um, we are matching, we have matching glasses by coincidence. It's not Space Doctor's uniform. <laughs> um, and my background is really in kind of brand marketing. Um, Gen Z insights. Um, I work with a lot of kind of indie beauty brands and some of the bigger players too, um, but really looking at kind of like social media and digital, um, especially, um, as well as kind of like just wellness in general and personal health care. And then we've got Steve as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve. I'm a director uh, working with Alex here at Space Doctors. And yeah, our specialism is understanding cultural change and how brands need to adapt their communication to stay relevant uh, in a changing cultural context. And we've worked across multiple categories of beauty uh, and different geographic um, markets and, and cultures uh, over time, helping brands with different issues relating to innovation, brand strategy, uh, and creative development. So yeah, looking um, through a cultural lens um, at brands um, in order to identify how they, how they can go forward. Um, it's an inspiring um, way of looking at things. Projects can range across different categories. They can be very wide ranging and broad, looking at the meaning of hair um, in sub-Saharan Africa was a particular um, favorite um, from back in the day to more executional, more um, tactical projects, for example, thinking about sustainability and how the rise of uh, waterless um, formats um, creates new opportunities um, and how established brands need to kind of uh, respond to that development and nail care isn't something I'm personally um, I'm more a beard care um, and glasses uh, face furniture kind of guy uh, but um, it's been yeah a, a category we've worked in a few times um, in recent years and on a personal level it's just such a kind of expressive c category um, and one where it's very apparent um, how there's there's a number of kind of exciting changes relating to gender in particular. For example, I was on holiday in um, uh, a kind of backwater of the, the of the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, and was intrigued, um, excited to see how black um, the male uh, staff in the um, chicken shop where I was um, uh, getting my evening meal were uh, were wearing black uh, nail nail polish. So you know the the kind of cultural influence of Travis Scott um, needs to be uh, acknowledged. Uh, um, and and clearly, yeah, this is a category which is going through exciting changes, which we will uh, talk to in the next 25, 30 minutes. Yeah, so apart from kind of our personal obsession with the category, we love it, it's super interesting. Um, why did we do this project? Why did we look, take a closer look at nails and the nail category? Really, um, we've just seen that nail nails and nail care, nail art has exploded in popularity in the last five years. So if we look at things like Pinterest searches, where a lot of people go to get their kind of information and tutorials and inspiration of things they're going to take to the salon or do themselves, um, we've just seen that those, those searches have absolutely exploded. Google searches are four times higher for nail inspiration than they were four or five years ago. 
Um, we also know that from COVID reports, beauty therapy and personal care was one of the top missed activities. Um, in that first week of restrictions and lockdown in the UK, it was missed more than the pub um, on the cinema. Um, and then finally, if we think about kind of the UK high street and how it is today, we're really seeing that personal care and beauty services are bucking that trend of closures, um, big shops closing down, um, moving away from the high street, moving to online. Actually, we're really seeing that nails um, and beauty care are really thriving where others are struggling to survive. So we're seeing kind of really high numbers of nail salons opening in the last um, five years in UK towns and cities, almost a thousand. The same with beauty salons, about 2000. So they're really up there with things like cafes and convenience stores in, um, defining the UK high street and really kind of being there and, and taking up that space. So in this kind of next uh, 30 minutes, we are going to dive into uh, nail designs themselves a little bit more closely and see if we can see any kind of patterns there into where that's moving. But first of all, we really wanted to explore some of those macro shifts that are contributing to the growing interest um, in the nail category and nail art in general. So first of all, we're really seeing the impact, as we mentioned from the pandemic, of at-home tech and treatments that have become more accessible and more affordable. Um, brands kind of selling starter kits, gel kits at home that actually um, do kind of sit in that affordable price. Um, but also really importantly, people were given the time during the pandemic to get creative, to try out new designs, to try things for themselves. So that has had a really big impact too. We know that uh, self-care in general is rising. Um, people are spending more time on themselves and this nail care really feels like a treat without breaking the bank. Secondly, um, we're really seeing outward expressions of who we are and really what we stand for, um, kind of politically, socially becoming more mainstream, um, really fueled by societal disasters, environmental disasters, that kind of digital protest culture is really impacting fashion and beauty. Um, and this has such a big impact on the nail category because nails lean into that sort of temporary expression. Um, you might get your nails done for a few weeks, but it's not something that's super permanent and it feels like, a, yeah, a bit more transient. Um, and you can really alter the style of your nails based on the seasons or based on your mood, um, but also based on who you are now, who you want to be and um, expressing who it is uh, expressing what it is that you want to say about yourself um you'll see kind of throughout here as well we spoke to some nail technicians some nail enthusiasts um, and really kind of those leading edge people in the category who are early adopters and who are pushing the boundaries so you'll kind of see those throughout um, and then lastly here, one of the last kind of big macro shifts is that wider culture in general is becoming much more expressive, much more centered around shape shifting. So if we think about things like the immeasurable impact of Euphoria, the TV series on beauty, um, taking uh, jewels and sticking them to your face as part of your everyday makeup look. We can see really jeweled kind of in intricate nail designs. And then also if we think about TikTok and YouTube, those really transformative tutorials that are kind of more extreme, more shocking, those transitions that would completely transform somebody into a completely new persona. And then just before we kind of delve into the future, we think it's important to acknowledge um, what those key contributors are over time um, into where we've got the nail industry today, which is a huge contributor to our 30 billion pounds a year UK beauty industry. We know they deserve a lot of recognition, but we also wanted to kind of, um, yeah, just acknowledge that nail care isn't new um, and talk about some of those influences. So if we think about where nail care started, uh, nail art started, it's actually really hard to pin down. Um, Egyptian mummies were found with gold tips on their fingers, um, henna on their fingertips as well. In China in 3000 BC, women used to make dyes from plants and flowers and mix it with things like um, beeswax to actually create kind of like a paint consistency. Um, things also like the significance of red nails has been really uh, consistent throughout the ages, um, really signaling sort of 
danger or excitement or intrigue. Um, but in terms of brands, Revlon um, are credited with the first version of how we see nail polish um, in the shops today. And they actually took the idea from uh, paint for cars and turn that into um, a sim similar sort of format to uh, what we use to paint our nails with today. Um, and we also know that kind of, we're all quite familiar with the lipstick effect. Um, through tough economic times, sales of lipstick tend to stay pretty kind of steady um, in that we know that people see it as this affordable treat, affordable luxury, and nails fit into that category too. So. Um, in 1995, Chanel released their Rogue Noir, which was, um, it's like that blood red kind of vampy colour um, that Uma Thurman wore um, in Pulp Fiction, um, sold out almost immediately. People's, it still kind of is one of their top selling products today. So we can kind of see how that, that significance of nails has always really been kind of quite consistent. We also know that um, in the 90s, um, Lil Kim's 90s like money manicure, so you can see it in the middle there, um, she actually had actual dollar bills um, on her nails for an award ceremony. Um, and then bringing that full circle in 2017, the Museum of Modern Art actually had that, that nail set on display alongside things like Levi's jeans, uh, the Wonder Bra and the little black dress um, in this exhibition that was all about garments and accessories that have had a lasting impact over the past century. So really seeing the significance of nails come into the forefront. And then bringing that to the UK specifically, um, Thea Green, who founded Nails Inc, was really instrumental in bringing those nail bars to the UK in around 1999. So she saw them in New York. She saw those like quick, uh, inexpensive manicures, and she thought there'd be a real similar uh, demand for that service in the UK too. And then in 2009, Wire Nails opened in Brixton, um, founded by a really inspir inspirational woman who took her kind of passion for hip hop and black culture and brought that through in kind of more of like an edgy manicure. Um, and then off the back of that, there's been conversations around, um, you know, white celebrities and white people in generally adopting those styles of nail art, almost as though they are kind of the trailblazers, whereas as we can see here, the roots of that style really run much more deeply. So bringing us all the way through to 2022, we know that nail art now, uh, manicures, nail treatments, aren't kind of an unusual sight. On the high street, you can get them for £10, £20. Um, but here we're also thinking about what is the true cost of those services? Can the trend really be inclusive for everyone? Um, in 2017, there was a report from the UK's anti-slavery commissioner, which showed a, a big link between kind of nail salons and human trafficking. We know that there's still a huge lack of regulation within the industry. Um, and we know that although uh, within the industry, we really revere nail artistry as, as a really important and impressive skill, we saw in the pandemic that maybe that value wasn't shared by others. Um, and that time was especially tough on people working in salons. It was one of the last services to reopen. Um, and it was something that I know a lot of people were really campaigning for the importance of beauty and backing beauty. So overall here, we can really see how nails are entwined with culture, with class, with race, gender, um, and later we'll explore how they can be a tool for political statements. So we're gonna move on now to our kind of semiotic analysis of nail designs. But just before that, we're gonna talk a little bit about what semiotics is, um, if you're not familiar with it and why it's a really um, important and useful tool for kind of mapping the trajectory of a category or how we can kind of analyze a brand and look at those kind of longer term uh, trends and movements. Thanks, Alex. So yeah, a few slides on the methodology and how that's helpful for brand building and creative development. So firstly, um, when, um, we think about semiotics. Uh, semiotics is about signs and their meaning uh, in society. Signs, whether they're traffic lights or clothing um, or fonts um, or colors, they help us to navigate and make sense of the world. And they also project something about who we are um, and, and our identity to other people. For example, the leather jacket um, is very different in terms 
of what that says uh, about you um, relative to uh, a navy blue suit, for example, and a serif typeface um, contrasted um, with sans serif or lowercase um, is very different in terms of the sort of formality um, and the seriousness that it carries. Similarly, colours um, like purple transport us to a world of, of magic, starbursts. We're kind of in the world um, of fantasy um, when we encounter that colour. So signs uh, are important within marketing um, in particular, we buy things not just for what they do and how they perform, but also for how they talk uh, and the language and the cues that they use. So um, it's important to consider signs um, as part of that marketing and, and brand development process. And the next slide just brings that uh, to life to show why semiotics matters. It's important to be intentional and considered um, in the choice of signs and the choice of cues um, that you're using, because if you aren't, then you can create an unwanted impression uh, in the mind of your audience, as we can see here, font choice can significantly influence the meaning and what a piece of communication means. So it's important to consider, are you seeking to kind of enchant and to seduce or, or romance um, your audience, or which obviously would lead you to the first font choice there, or are you looking to wake them up or to, to kind of shock them um, out of their complacency, which would perhaps lead you to something closer to the, to the second um, uh, style of font there. So when you change the sign, you change the meaning, it's important to uh, be intentional uh, and considered in choice of, of um, of signs that we're using. Then if we look um, close, more closely at the methodology, semiotics uh, is about analyzing a brand and how it's communicating relative to the culture and to the competitive context. These two examples on the right, they're both uh, about beauty, but they show that beauty can mean very different things. Dove on the left uh, is much more about transparency, authenticity, um, being true to who you really are. Whereas Illamasqua on the right, uh, it takes us to the world of fantasy, uh, really much more about uh, exploring a hidden side of you, um, telling the story um, of a hidden part of you that perhaps isn't apparent uh, to, to people. So both of these brands stand for beauty, but it's important to, to consider what meaning uh, as a brand you're seeking to own uh, and connect with. So that takes us to various benefits that we, we get from that um, on the left-hand side there. Um, tracking cultural evolution, getting closer to the meaning that underpins brands, going beyond where consumers can, can take you. As Henry Ford famously said, if I asked consumers, they'd have um, answered that they wanted a faster horse uh, rather than a car. So looking at culture um, is a way to look at change, um, is a way to look at kind of what tomorrow uh, looks like rather than just reflecting uh, today's expectations um, and finally inspiring new and differentiated marketing strategy and creative. We'll then look at one of the key frameworks and Alex will bring this to life in the in the final section. Um, this is the code trajectory, um, which is a framework that allows us to look at uh, cultural change. Uh, importantly, human needs are unchanging. They're kind of biologically determined, whereas culture is constantly adapting, uh, constantly shifting. We can see that beauty culture um, has been impacted hugely by sustainability, by the climate crisis, um, as well as by the kind of proliferation of digital culture. 
um, and digital expectations um, leading to kind of expectations of, of immediacy um, and fluidity. Um, so yeah, we look um, at the code trajectory, which takes us through norms in culture that are residual um, or dated that feel part of our grandmother's generation, uh, norms that are dominant, which feel kind of centre ground, the things that you see all the time, um, potentially kind of feeling a little bit generic, like wallpaper, um, important for brands to access um, and connect with those norms, but they don't necessarily uh, deliver differentiation. And finally, um, we can also see kind of the emergent um, signs um, and developments within culture. And it's important, particularly within innovation, but also just to, um, to, to demonstrate a leadership within the category. It's important for brands also to kind of stay in touch um, with the emergence. And obviously, in a category where novelty um, and change is kind of hardwired into it, like beauty, um, the emergent um, is particularly important. So that's the, the code trajectory, one of the key frameworks that um, semiotics works with and that, um, yeah, can, can kind of unpack um, value for clients. Importantly, understanding the changing cultural context helps us to judge what's driving consumer response to brand initiatives and helps us to understand how the brand might need to evolve, what it might, if we look at the emergent, we often get clues as to what a brand's missing out on um, and yeah, where it might go next. So that's um, the, the code trajectory. We'll then just close off the methodology section, looking at ways that semiotics drives commercial advantage, thinking about brand strategy firstly, and understanding what your role in culture is. Semiotics is really helpful um, to think about how to own your cultural space, um, clarifying positioning issues. Secondly, uh, often um, we can understand, we can see that copy or packaging isn't working effectively, but we don't necessarily know why. Um, so crafting rich and resonant communication, understanding kind of what may be holding um, a particular piece of brand communication back. Shaping the future, the code trajectory obviously spoke directly to that. Um, and having a kind of forward-looking lens, um, helping to lead rather than follow, and a, yeah, sort of more of a foresight um, perspective that helps to future-proof brands. And finally, um, developing a creative strategy that's inspired by and, and connects um, to different culture different cultural norms and different um, communities within culture. So energizing and sharpening execution. So those are different ways that semiotics can help. We'll then in the final section, look at applying that code trajectory framework within the nail care category. Great. So yeah, we'll kind of move back into nail care specifically, but hopefully that gives you an idea of um, what semiotics is and what we do. Um, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can have a bit of a, a session at the end if you have anything that you wanted to know more about. Um, but yeah, so let's dive back into nails. Um, in the residual space here, so for all of these kind of this whole trajectory, we looked at social media, we looked at brand output, we looked at different kind of cultural signs um, and signals to, to look at these, but you can already tell by kind of looking at these images that we've picked out here, that this code already kind of feels a little bit outdated, a little bit more residual. Um, so if we're looking at kind of neutral colors, um, showing healthy nails, um, really about those kind of subtle patterns or subtle adornments. And this space here is really about signaling your health, signaling that you are polished, uh, put together, um, healthy hands, healthy nails, and really kind of keeping everything quite neat, um, trim and in place. So it could be that we're looking at maybe some sort of kind of those brands or those those posts that more center around the polished feeling and the well-kept kind of put together output. So that's the residual space. And then as we move into dominant, which is kind of more of the mainstream today, this is all around 
extending your aesthetic. Um, so nails here are really an extension of your personality and they aesthetically match the rest of your style. Um, as we saw at the start, kind of all those Pinterest searches, all those Google searches, they come from such a wealth of and a bank of images, of inspiration, of creative output that people can navigate their way through. And the reason that we've got to that space is because everybody is finding a way to kind of create their own style and signal their own style through their nails. So here we're really looking at nails moving up through the ranks of kind of importance as um, a part of your wider aesthetic. So if you think about creating a look um, that's up there and as important as fashion choices, as color cosmetics, um, hair in creating a look is something that has really moved up what people will consider when they're thinking of um, maybe creating a look for a night out or if we're planning like a photo shoot, nails are definitely a key part of that. And they're probably much um, like further in the planning stage rather than kind of an afterthought really. And then moving on to the emergent, which is the, the stage, which is a bit more kind of in the future. These will be kind of the more dominant codes of tomorrow. Here, we're really just seeing that um, all the rules are kind of out the window and nails are just absolutely a blank canvas for creativity. So the nail is a super small area to be extremely artistic, extremely detailed. We're seeing people be a lot more kind of playful, 3D art, accessories, extreme decoration. Um, and not only that, it's that nails also have a purpose to show your beliefs, uh, your culture, your attitudes. Um, we can see kind of in that example at the top of the nails is kind of like the contraceptive pill. They can be a real response to events around the world. And kind of as we alluded to, just as impactful and respected as makeup artistry, we're seeing nail artistry up there too, and kind of just in general up there with as impactful as just art and as kind of making that statement through art. Um, we're looking at kind of wildness here, freedom, um, and yeah, just dialing up the, those extreme sort of formats. And one of the leading edge consumers that we spoke to, as you can see here in the corner, said that we're really kind of focusing on our nails so much more of those intricate and detailed work. And it's, it's almost like a mini Picasso um, on your hands. So looking at that a little bit more closely, um, as we kind of touched on earlier, the impact of digital culture and digital worlds is really um, kind of immeasurable in terms of turning up the extremity, turning up um, and giving people that permission and license to experiment, fantasy. Um, those dream worlds online can be something really tangible that you can create for yourself through nails. We're bringing that digital into the real world. And as we're seeing that it's digital is much more frequent, extreme, um, those social media posts with those really um, impressive transitions, those are the ones that are getting the uh, engagement and a kind of the most fundamental influence on beauty culture in recent times is that kind of digitization of our inspiration. Um, and it really means that nails are having a moment again, Ge generally and be beauty is kind of having that moment as we all know, I'm sure, but nail specifically as well. And there's also a link with the growing kind of protest culture, body positivity, um, and also community online. So really sharing those looks that are super inspirational, finding kind of your tribe of people who align with what you're interested in, what you want to see, whether that is lava lamp nails or whether that is something a bit more neutral, but those people are kind of finding each other. It's more niche, but it's becoming more extreme. And kind of to sum up and to bring all this together and make it more something that brands can use. Um, as part of these projects, we tend to drill into what 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 does this mean for brands today? Um, so we have a few kind of um, provocations here. First of which is um, thinking about um, people um, at the heart of rooted culture. Culture works in a top-down way and in a bottom-up way. Top-down, uh, we obviously look to uh, influencers. We look to Kylie Jenner, um, whoever it might be, and follow them. 
but how can we also kind of connect with that uh, rooted culture and acknowledge uh, the creativity um, that exists within within everyone and help to kind of foster um, and encourage that and thinking, you know, for example, of social media um, as a forum where um, there are challenges, live events, um, takeovers, things which kind of um, allow for participation um, and more of a kind of two way uh, exchange um, to happen uh, within the category. Secondly, Alex talked uh, a lot about sh shape shifting and the influence of digital culture, and this is yeah very artistic uh, um, category. Um, so how we can kind of fuel that thirst uh, for experimentation, uh, perhaps more than any other category um, in beauty, um, we can kind of be creative at low cost um, within the nail care uh, category. And nails, uh, somebody uh, once said that they're sort of part of the body, but also not part of the body. Um, so it feels unlike skin, which we're kind of more protective over, um, we're more hesitant um, about adorning it um, and, um, and augmenting it. Um, there's a real kind of scope uh, and flexibility uh, around nails um, and yeah, expressivity that um, allows us to be much more kind of free um, and, and transformational. Yeah, and as we did mention already that this is such a grassroots trend, um, it's not brands telling people how they should be, um, how they should look or how they should create those, those extreme nail looks, that's really come from people themselves, so it's really bubbling up. It's the early adopters who are pushing the boundaries, it's the communities. So what we could think about here is how can brands really harness that human-led creativity but still retain um, inspirational or aspirational authority but lean into that this is really coming um, coming from people and people are really experimenting themselves and then finally thinking about nail art as that really transient expression of creativity um, and it's one of kind of those the only spaces in beauty where the uh, the the art itself can be seen just as much by the wearer as it can by other people. You know, you need a mirror to look at your makeup or to look at your hair, but you actually see your nails all the time as well. So thinking about how else might we frame beauty um, as inward facing and kind of that art and expression for yourself and for you personally. And that's everything from us today, even though I could carry on talking about nails forever. Um, so our emails and everything are there if you have any questions or comments or want to know um, anything else and yeah I guess um, if there's any questions Steve that will come up in the chat that we wanted to discuss or if anybody has any questions now um, we do have some time to share. Yeah there's um, only one at the moment but yeah we definitely uh, would invite any further comments either on the methodology or on the uh the material that we that we shared and um, the first uh quest the question is um how do these extreme formats work in terms of convenience what's the balance can we see this coming up more in certain groups um or in um certain professions hmm. i mean yeah, yeah i would say it's a really interesting one because yeah anyone who's worn like acrylics and tried to type <laughs> and tried to like open a can of coke it's really hard <laughs> um and i think what we're seeing is these kind of as we sort of mentioned a little bit that these are almost like uh can feel like costume um for like specific events or um a specific moment that you really want to have those more extreme um nails but i think it could also come through in more subtle ways as well so we're seeing those people really pushing the boundaries um and go really extreme with long nails and those 3d adornments and things like that but i think that's that's something that's because of social media we like to see those extreme expressions doesn't mean we're going to recreate them all the time but we might save them because we think they're really cool and we will take them to our uh, nail technician and they might do kind of like a paired back version of that. But I think it's important to note how the boundaries are kind of at the edges are really being stretched. I guess also there's, you, you know, nails are a form of adaptive technology. So, you know, that there is obviously a tension there between 
uh, creativity and, and convenience, things that are super creative take a hell of a long time. Mm. Um, but forms of technology, um, R&D um, that can basically reconcile that that tension um is i think going to be an so and specific, like thermochromatic um color um within within hair color um a sort of a, a light effect that reveals itself um within certain situations um or settings so you know i think there are forms of of expression and creativity which you know the, the role of the brand in a way um the role of the technology is to to kind of uh to make that tension um you know uh mm. to reconcile uh that um, yeah and i think um just going back to euphoria like i feel like i talk about euphoria so much but it was just so influential um mm. the convenience of sticking uh diamantes mm. on your face is actually pretty inconvenient um but that trend almost took off so much more than I think anybody could have predicted and I think it's kind of uh almost like a similar space in that we we might not necessarily be saying these are kind of for everyday wear but they might you know you might create a specific look with loads of diamantes specifically for social media specifically for one day so it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be kind of that um yeah everyday convenience but it is something that in general is really impacting um the category almost like couture and couture week um something that's not necessary that people are going to wear themselves but they'll take loads of inspiration from mm -hmm. but and yeah we could talk about this for, a, for yeah. some time <laughs> but you know st stencils and hacks and and how to's um it, it, you know this is a kind of providing guide guidance and facilitation um is is obviously yeah another kind of way to address that um that tension mm. there was another question there but unless i'm uh imagining it it's now disappeared um no I don't. seems to have uh we can uh we can always take a look through and we can email you guys i think we'll have those we'll have those questions saved so we'll have a look through and um get back to anybody who had any other thoughts um but yeah do feel free to email us um i know there's loads of other kind of cool events going on as part of british beauty week so make sure you check it out and yeah i think that's everything from us thank you so much for joining on your lunch break or on your lunch time um and yeah thank you so much it was really fun